Um, yeah, doing all right. Getting there. I think we're just about there for today. There was something. It was really good, yeah. We had a really good time. Um, great talks. Great sort of people get it, mixing and getting to know each other properly, which is lovely. Here, let me give you one of those. Thank you. Come and join the table if you want. Have you met Peter before? I met him five times. We go to um, Moor Hall in Cookham. It's quite near Maiden, uh, Maidenhead. No, Maidstone. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Maidenhead. Maidenhead, not Kent. Um, it's a slightly sort of, um, it's not quite a kind of De Vere quality, but the setting's lovely, and it's much cheaper than the alternatives these days, I think. It's, it serves us really well. Hey, James, to welcome back. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Great to see you. You're back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Have you just recently come back? Not actually that recently. Funny yeah. enough, I'd sort of forgotten about this. Yeah, but yeah. I just, I've seen COVID have killed it off. Yeah. And then I was chatting with Claire. Yeah. And she mentioned it. I was like, of course I know this. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's quite a strong little um, PwC contingent, actually. Yeah. Yeah, not so many for me why, but it's a good group. Who come from PwC? Wow, so introduce them to you if anyone come today. Well, I actually, um, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. on there today. I'm going to hand my notes in. Wow, where are you heading up to? It's just at Charing Cross. So oh, it's yeah. It's a BGM. Yeah. So it's okay. Right. Yeah. You're, you're handing notes in today. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. <laughs> so I thought, what better way to celebrate? Yeah, come yeah, down, yeah. To <laughs> come and have a, come and have yeah. a steak sandwich. Anyway, are you well? Yeah, doing, doing very well, thanks. Yeah, we're doing. Just the one kid's dead, or? No, you've now got three. Yeah. How old are they? Uh, five, thanks Chris. Five, two, and ten months. Wow. Yeah. What about you? No, married. So married February 2020, just a while ago. Okay. You know, Argentina. Yes. No, no kids. No kids. Yeah, yeah. My wife's been married. She's yeah. 26. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Two kids. Wow. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. And you're, what, what, are you, what are you up to? Um, yeah, full time ministry. I'm. I'm yeah. Still here, but also involved at St. Nick's Sunday Church. Um, started six years ago now. Um, so I'm a curate there and do this. And also we started a lunch center in Victoria quite recently, so I helped to oversee that as well. Um, that's on Wednesdays. Not, not that near Charing Cross, but I don't know. Not really. Is it? It's not on the district because in the back then. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah. Just we're very near St. James's, we're very near St. James's, so if you fancy a cheap journey, yeah. well, we do have one guy that comes in. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know, I'd plan to come in today. Great. Sort of, um, yeah, because did COVID kill it off for a while? Well, we had to stop. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we're still we're still getting reestablished, really, right. but we, we've basically always been open whenever we can be, even okay. if it was just to live stream from here or have a couple of people. Um, but we sort of um, got back going in a sort of remnant form, I don't know, can't remember now, ages ago. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just beginning to re-establish. Um, but it will take time because people are still getting established, I think, in terms of work patterns. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's still, I mean, even today in the office, you know, there's still a lot of people that aren't there. Yeah, 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 exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, so that. Yeah. Hey, good to see you again. You're right. Nice to see you. Is Jeff with uh, with you today? Yeah, he is. Ah, great. Hi, Shervin. Good to see you. Um, well, not today actually, but we we try to, but it's fraught with difficulties. Really? Well, yeah, yeah, it is. Live streaming is very difficult. Surprisingly difficult. And <laughs> internet's one issue. But um, I think trying to do it from small devices, they're not really built for it. And so just it can be difficult. Um, so normally something goes wrong with the software or something changes on the phone which interrelates with the software or something's logged out. Or, um, it was, yeah, it's just it's just not that straightforward, and no one's really using it right now. So I think I'm going to can it. It was a good way of just recording the talk and having it straight on YouTube. Yeah. Um, but I think we might can it because it, it feels like 
a wasted effort, really. But yeah. Yeah, yeah grab, grab some food. Grab some food. If I could um, interrupt conversations there. Sorry to break into conversations. I think for sake of time, we'll make a start as others filter in and join us. Do keep grabbing lunch and eating lunch and all of the rest of it as we continue, as we always say. It's lovely to see you. Um, you'll see some notices on the front of the uh, handout. And the one really to take note of is number three there. We've got our carol service coming up. We um, take the opportunity each year to, to hold a carol service. We have uh, a musician and a soloist who come in and play for us and sing for us at Guy's Chapel, which is an excellent venue, just the other side of the railway arches from here, so probably about a five-minute walk through the station for most of you. And it's an excellent venue, and more importantly, will be, it will be an opportunity to sing some carols and to hear uh, the good news of Jesus Christ presented. So we hope this will be a really good opportunity for you to uh, come and enjoy and to invite your colleagues along. You'll find a link to the um, so the flyer, which you can forward on, just here, the QR code, if you scan that, that'll take you straight to the flyer. We'll have some hard copies next week as well, but do make a note of that. That's Tuesday the 6th, if you're able to sort of make a point of joining us in town on that day. That will then take us to the end of the term at the London Bridge Talks. We'll have a short break over Christmas. I believe that backers tends to get um, booked up with Christmas parties from that time onwards, and we'll resume in January. So few things just to note there. I'm going to lead us, if I may, in a short prayer, and then we're going to pick up our series in Philippians, living with um, a future focus, and we'll be looking at Philippians chapter 3, the second half, which is on page 981 of these Bibles. Our conviction as we meet together under God's Word and hear it and discuss it is that this is how God works today, so that's why I'm going to pray and ask that he would. Let's pray together. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that in giving us your word, you've given us all that we need to continue the Christian life and to find out about reality, to find out um, about Jesus Christ. And we pray today that you will help us to have a future focus as we listen to your words. Please enable us to put aside the day's activities and to um, concentrate our thoughts on your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great. Well, I'm going to read um, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through to chapter 4, verse 1, and that's on page 981. 981, Philippians 3, starting at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things." But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Straight over to Chris.
Well, it's good to be back at the London Bridge Talks. Do keep that passage open, and you'll find on the reverse of the handout you've given on the way in some points I'm going to be making over the next few minutes together. Tom, can you just give me a thumbs up that I've not turned this off? Is it working okay? No. It's working. Welcome online if you're joining us as well. So, we're in Philippians chapter 3, and we're going through to 4, verse 1. Our subject, grown-up Christian thinking. Grown-up Christian thinking. Throughout the letter, Paul has been challenging the thinking processes of the Christians in Philippi. And today, our passage brings this to a very clear point. Have a look at 3, verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. What Paul wants for his readers, original and us today gathered in Viva Backhaus, is thinking that gives us purpose and direction in life. Thinking that acts as a clear lens, enabling day-to-day decisions through all the ups and downs and the usual sort of rigmarole of life, things that can otherwise weigh us down, to be mature, hence our subject, grown-up Christian thinking. And there are two parts to this. Here is the first. Paul says we should be restless. Why? Because we are not home yet. 3 verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Now, it's such a simple point, but so important to grasp. You see, Paul has not yet fully received the goal of the Christian life. Why is that? Well, he's still alive, and he hasn't yet obtained the resurrection of the dead. Look at verse 11, immediately before this verse, the resurrection from the dead. That is a a technical way to be talking about heaven. Paul stands there speaking to the Philippians, and he says, I'm not in heaven yet. The final and eternal home for all Christians is not yet mine. Now, by the time Paul was writing, there was no doubt of the validity of this claim. Jesus had risen from the dead in the recent past, his resurrection, undeniable proof that there is life beyond the grave. Heaven's doors were verified at that point as being authentic, and they were opened to all of those who had faith in Jesus because of the resurrection of Jesus. And so just sort of linking the obvious point again, Paul's not there yet. He hasn't yet obtained what he knows the whole goal of the Christian life is. And so for us now, like Paul, we're not in heaven yet if we're Christians. Grown-up Christian thinking involves a mindset which starts like that. A restlessness, therefore, a steady dissatisfaction, you might say, with where we are now. That's a little bit easier, isn't it, when London is sort of gray and drizzling. We seem to have been in a cloud for the last few days. The language of the verses that follow is taken from the athletic track. Uh, It could be a sprint, it could be a marathon, it could be one of those those crazy sort of walking races where they've got to have two feet on the ground at any one time. They sort of wiggle their elbows in a rather sort of strange way. But the point is very simple. You see, until the athlete crosses the line, until the finish line is behind them, they're not home yet. There is work to be done. There is a race to be run. A restless, inevitable pursuit, therefore, of the final goal must follow. So I guess the question that raises for us is, what does this restlessness actually look like in practice? Well, I put in three sub-points there underneath that first heading. End of verse 13, the first one, forget what lies behind. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Now, when Paul talks about forgetting what lies behind, he's referring to the things he's just been speaking about. Uh, If you were with us before in the talk a couple of weeks ago, I, I homed in on this a little bit. He's, he's talking about all of the stuff that happens before one becomes a Christian. Um, I mean, before all that, in Paul's life, he'd been a high achiever. He'd reached a very, very high level, as high as you can get within the legal profession. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had unquestionable religious pedigree. And again, if you were with us before, he listed all his incredible sort of religious pursuits, including what was considered a very high-notch affair, to actually murder members of the Christian church in the name of Judaism. He was as religious as they got. But 
useless currency as far as heaven is concerned. Paul says, forget it. Forget all of those things you might have clung to. And again, if you were with us a few weeks ago, um, it's not just the religious pedigree and religious achievements. It's also, Paul uses this world, word to describe anything that can be achieved in this world. He says, leave it all behind. Useless. 3 verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You see, at the point of Paul's conversion, a shift took place. He realized that not only his achievements, but any worldly gain was useless in terms of the currency for entering heaven. And so Paul says, leave it all behind. Turn your back on it. It has no value at all. I recently read a story of um, a chap called William Borden. He's an interesting guy. I, I doubt you will have heard of him. He's not really famous for, for anything apart from the thing I'm going to tell you. So I'm not going to give you the headline of what he's famous for because that'll kill the very thing that um, the story builds to. He was born in Chicago, 1887, and he was part of a wealthy family. As was the way of the world back then, it was considered pretty normal. If you're part of a wealthy family, this big sort of family business, you, you went off to university, you had your years of education, and then you went into the family business. Well, that was all exactly as William Borden had planned. He was delighted with that. There was a problem, of course, because when he got to Yale University, he became a Christian. And he decided at that point to turn his back on the world. He decided at that point, as was radical in those days, to turn his back on the world and go against the family business and go to China and take the gospel there. There were a few others going to China in those days. But it was interesting because leaving everything behind caused huge difficulties with his family and friends. And there was a great, great sort of movement amongst his family and friends to try to change his mind. They said he's mad. China, crazy place to go in that time of, the, of, of history. And, and the sort of the security and the wealth meant that he could have had everything perfectly lined up in this world. Well, he got on a boat to China. He wasn't going to be deterred, deterred by his friends or family. And as was the plan, the boat stopped in Egypt. He wanted to make a short stay there. He had a bit of sort of um, education and language that he wanted to sort of brush up on before he got back on the boat to China. Sadly, in Egypt, though, he contracted spinal meningitis, and he died. Now, after his death, a note was found on his body in his immediate effects. And it summarized his life very well, six words. No reserve, no retreat, no regrets. He was 26 years old. I'd like to suggest that is mature Christian thinking. That's exactly the mindset that Paul is talking about here, turning your back on things of this world, sitting loose to them for the sake of the gospel. And it's interesting, when, when Paul says forgetting all that lies behind, forgetting, it's in the present tense. In other words, Paul's expecting a Christian to keep on needing to remind ourselves of forgetting the past. Because you know what it's like. That achievement of the past or that great bit of material gain will come back to occupy your life, and you'll think, oh, yeah, I'm pretty good at that. I'm quite valuable because of this. As I thought about this and sort of applied it to myself a bit, I mean, lots of examples came to mind of that sort of stuff. Um, easy to sort of regret, isn't it, the wasted years, perhaps or bad decisions that might have been made that have far-reaching consequences, deep regrets. And Paul's saying, all of that stuff which may come back to distract you or even haunt you, turn your back on it. Leave it behind. Last summer, uh, I went with my family to Italy. I think it's one of the best family holidays we had. We, we've never been to Italy as a family before. We, enjoyed every aspect. Everyone says, oh, amazing place, amazing food, all of that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, that, that was all great. We loved the people. We thought they were three-dimensional in every respect, and we had some good conversations sort of along the way. One of the things that um, we heard was a tradition that takes place in some parts of Italy. We didn't, um, we weren't in a place where it takes part, but I think it's in places of the south. On the stroke of midnight, uh, the families are all sort of gathering in this part of, of Italy, and the tradition is um, leading up until midnight, all of the windows are shut, and um, the, the house is very sort of contained with family and friends gathered. And then at the stroke of midnight, all of the windows are sort of thrown open, shutters thrown back, and one item 
is thrown out of the window. So I gather it's a very dangerous place to be. <laughs> These little towns gathered in the south, you do not want to be walking around um, in the middle of the night, midnight, on New Year's Eve, um, as a piece of sort of IKEA furniture gets chucked out of the window. Apparently, families gather everything. Um, and the point is to have something, because it's symbolic, crockery, uh, detested ornaments, and definitely IKEA furniture, apparently, um, gets, gets thrown out. And the whole thing, of course, is, is a, a great sort of picture. We're not going to hold on to the things from the last year that we didn't like. We're going to instead chuck them away. Well, what might it be for you, physically or mentally, that's holding you back in this world? Runners who are running a race, uh, occasionally they will look back, don't they? There, there are a few situations in history where, where a runner who was in the lead glances back over his shoulder, her shoulder, and, um, and loses the race as a result of that hesitation, that glancing back. What might anchor you to this world? Well, mistakes made and learnt don't need to be repeated. That's the point. Present tense, forgetting what lies behind. And instead, you'll see the second sub-point, focus on the prize ahead. See, verse 13 continues, straining forward to what lies ahead. Press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God. That's how Christians are to think. Press on to the prize. Uh, the idea of pressing on, again, it's, it's very active language, straining forward, forgetting everything around, just focusing on the goal. If you've seen that old film, Chariots of Fire, there's that wonderful film, a wonderful scene where I think it's Eric Liddell, his... Is, um, is doing the 100-meter race or some race, but anyway, something that's sort of clearly sort of marked out before him. And, and there's a moment that they sort of build up. It's hard, isn't it, when you've got a 10-second race. You've got to be pretty you know, dramatic in making the points because it's all over so quickly. And, and the way that it works is that um, you, you start, you sort of, the camera sort of homes in, and so you see the, the finish line from Eric's perspective. And everything else blurs. And all you see is the track, single lane, with the finish line ahead. And Paul is making that point here. Make the goal, the finish line, all that you press on towards. Focus on the prize ahead. You see, Christians have a radically different perspective. The restless pursuit of the future prize, if you like. We know where we are going, and we have no doubt about the prize's value. One commentator puts it like this. Our highest condition in this world is not the attainment of perfection, but the recognition of heights above us, which are as yet unreached from generation to generation. For the individual, the condition of our progress is a distance beckoning us, f feeling us that we have already attained, neither are we already perfect. Mature Christian thinking. And so Paul says, you know, in light of these things, well, that next sub-point there, follow other mature Christians. Follow other mature Christians. You see, the Christian life is not a race where we're sort of competing against one another. Um, God has given us many examples of people to help us on the way, encourage us to get there. It's more of a fun run, if you like. Uh, verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Gather a sensible group of mature Christians around you and walk, run, press on with them. But Paul is saying here, keep your eyes on the right people. That means people who are focused on the end, people who have the right attitude in this world. It's easy to be distracted by people who might weigh us down, isn't it? Um, there are many examples that Paul gives at this point of people not to be watching. Look at verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is their destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. Minds set on earthly things. These seem to be people that Paul is very aware of, that they, that they started the race, but they didn't continue the race. They gave up along the way. Distracted by this world, perhaps tricked into thinking that they should have left behind. Who are these people? Well, Paul says he's often spoken about them. People that he was closely relationally attached to. Verse 19, now their God is their belly. Heavily distracted, 
bodily desires, worldly achievements, experiences, and just lots of good food or equivalents. And you can see how easy it would be to be the sort of person who's excited by Christ for a period of life and then puts it on hold to focus on whatever it is, the successful career, the sports, the extravagances, the temptations, they all just become too much. One day they slowed down, they took their eyes off the prize, and it was fatal. And I think it's easy, isn't it, to sort of buy into that sort of culture that um, wants to sort of have it all, do the Christian thing and do the world thing. And I guess it's easy to buy into all sorts of difficulties around us. And so Paul says we need to have the right people to watch. As I look back in my life, I mean, there are so many people that have encouraged me. Uh, my family were a huge influence. I mean, I was a, I was a ter- when I was in my 20s, early 20s, I sort of had been brought up as a Christian. I never stopped believing, but I just sort of drifted in my late teens and early 20s. And um, it was only really in my young 20s when I, I got became part of a good Bible teaching church that I was brought back with a bump. But there were quite a few mature Christians around me that just knew that I was behaving in a stupid way. I had a leader on camp who I think wrote me about 55 letters over the course of sort of six years of just drifting. Um, A couple of Christian friends at school, great encouragement. And of course, since I've sort of grown up in my my Christian life over the last 20, 30 years now, a huge group of men and women in and around the city that have been a massive encouragement to me and keeping me with my eyes focused on the prize. We walk together. We run for the prize together. Not home yet, says Paul. So restless in the world. Restless in the world. But of course, there's another point to all of this, the flip side, if you like. Um, Because, of course, we need to be motivated to be restless in this world. And that comes from the second point, which I'll deal with much more briefly. You see, secondly, we can be content because Jesus has secured our future. Have a look at chapter 3, verse 12. Second half. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I personally, as a Christian, need to grasp that I am owned by another. You'll see that first sub-point. We belong to Jesus. If you're a Christian here today, then that's you. You are owned by another. When I first became a Christian, I think that was when I was six years old. And although, as I said, I I drifted a little bit, I think my ownership remained intact. At that point, the deed of of ownership was transferred, if you like, from me to, to Jesus. That's what becoming a Christian means, giving full ownership to Jesus. And so now I need to, new, I need to view this world and everything in it from this new perspective, owned by another. Um, I don't think this type of thinking comes naturally. Paul, in his own life, was talking about that moment on the road to Damascus when he met Jesus Christ. At that moment, Jesus took hold of him. Um, Paul was on a terrible path. All sorts of ridiculous things that he was doing in the name of Judaism. Um, And he was told plainly by Ananias shortly after, take the gospel to the nations. That's what you're going to do. Jesus owns you now. You will take the message of Jesus to the nations and you will proclaim it to the world, to kings, to princes. Well, Jesus' death and resurrection has secured the past. And Paul says if we're mature, we should think like this too. And so what this does wonderfully is we press on towards the end. We can be confident, absolutely content because of what Jesus has achieved. And we get that on the second sub-point there, the description of our citizenship in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. It's a done deal. Verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. From it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. One day, we will be like Jesus. You see, again, that that point of ownership, when we sort of give our deed of personal covenant and ownership to Jesus when he owns us, it's like he gives us a passport, a passport to heaven. Jesus has already made us his own. And one day we can walk confidently with him and the mature Christians around us into heaven. Until then, 4 verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, 
whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm. How do we stand firm? By putting this mature Christian thinking into practice. You see, we're not home yet. And that's going to be really obvious in about five minutes when you walk back outside and you're back in the gray cloud. Heaven will not be like that. Okay, just in case the steak sandwich has brought you into a sort of lulled you into a full sense of security, thinking this is pretty good. The heaven is going to be exponentially better than all of these things. But what do we do while we wait? Well, let's just put those two points together and you'll see we have a restless contentment, intentionally sort of at odds with each other, a restless contentment. That should drive us from day to day. You see, we must remember that the prize is guaranteed. We can be restless in our pursuit precisely because Christ has taken hold of us. And so we are liberated to ruthlessly chase down this heavenly prize. So restless, racing, striving forward. The dog, dogged determination, if you like, chucking out anything that weighs us down. Not home yet. Um, and yet all the time, deeply assured, confident, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Heaven stands secure. You've got that passport in your pocket right now. Guaranteed entrance. No challenge as you walk through the pearly gates. I am his. If you're a Christian here today, you are his. Citizen. Heaven is our home. Until then, restless contentment drives us on. That is what mature Christian thinking is all about. Some stuff to think about. Some chat around tables. Tom, I'll hand back to you.